Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Alan Little. Hello. The unseen guest at the table today is the 18th century Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, the father of liberal economics, whose invisible hand of market forces continues to shape the world we live in, more so now than ever, arguably. With the dramatic economic rise of Asia, 500 years of unchallenged global domination by the West are coming to an end in our lifetimes. What is the infrastructure of opportunity in the crashing turmoil of South Asia's rapid urbanisation? Mohsin Hamid's new novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, takes us into the heart of these questions through the story of one man who rises from rural poverty to extraordinary wealth. The Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Catherine Boo spent years in one slum community in Mumbai and brings to dramatic life characters struggling to survive on the margins of the new economy. Bruce Norris also won a Pulitzer Prize for his play Clybourne Park, which opened here in 2010. He's back at the Royal Court in London with a new play which probes the moral character of an economic model based on the pursuit of individual wealth. And closer to home, Peter Moffat, the television dramatist who brought us Criminal Justice and Silk, has written a new series called The Village, which follows a single community in rural Derbyshire through the upheavals of the 20th century. Mohsin Hamid, let's start with you. How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. It doesn't sound like a novel at all. It sounds like a self-help manual. It is a self-help manual, partly as a joke. Um, but partly, once I began joking with the idea of a self-help manual, I started to realise that writing novels for me is an act of self-help. And, and even reading novels is a sort of self-help act. So the joke became more earnest as the, prog- as the project Continued. You do something quite interesting. You write the novel almost entirely in the second person singular. You, you, you go to her room. You start a new company. You, you, you move to the city. You get an education. Why have you done that? Well, I think one of the things that makes the novel form, uh, written stories, special compared to you know other uh, narrative forms or different from other narrative forms, is the degree of of creation that takes place inside the reader. So, in a novel, you get handed the source code of of words, letters, abstract symbols, and you make those into an experience in your mind. And that that creation, um, what you, the reader, bring to a book is, I think, quite peculiar. And so this novel is about about you, the reader, very substantially. It is, because the main character doesn't have a name... So it's easy, and so he's every man really. He's me. He's anybody who's moved from a village to a city, or anybody who's experienced turmoil in his life. It's a very effective way of uh, enabling the reader to identify him more strongly. You chose not to give any of your characters in this book names. Yeah, I thought that um, I wanted to blur the boundaries of 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 the self, and um, to play around with that notion. And so when we read fiction and when we are told stories, part of what happens, I think is that this, this process of empathy is, is engaged. And we start imagining being other people. We start imagining being other selves. Um, having this nameless environment is a way to, to make that easier for the reader to do. It's also something that's been done for over a thousand years in Sufi poetry. So there's a particular stand of, of what you might call Islamic mystical poetry, which is effectively love poems um, that are told to the beloved you, um, that are frequently nameless. And, you know, it's a, it's, it was a way to, it is a way to change our relationship to the universe by, by viewing it as an extension of the self. Let's talk about the, the life that you plot in the book. He starts off in rural poverty and very quickly as a young man gets himself an education and starts to live in a society unrecognisable to his parents, never mind his grandparents, and to start making a contribution to shaping that society. But as he gets older, by increments in the book, his life becomes less and less about opportunity and more and more about danger, even though he's getting fabulously wealthy. Well, the novel is, is partly a story of, of growth, which is what the market, what capitalism... Um, the capitalist narrative is a growth narrative. More money, more GDP, more cars, um, a bigger pension fund. But human existence is equally about loss. Um, we lose our health, uh, we lose our loved ones, and we lose our lives. And, and uh, the market doesn't really have a narrative for loss. And that's why this, this story, supposedly about growth, begins to elicit this, this counter story about loss, which, which religion, for example, has been one of the ways we've had narratives that help us deal with mortality and loss. But as religion becomes increasingly politicized, 
um, it perhaps is less engaged with those questions and more with group identity and is, is serving less well to do that. Catherine Boo, do you, we'll talk about your book in a second, but do you recognise the trajectory of this life? Very much so. I, in, in a way, I, there were so many um, uh, things that, that, that in, in your book I, I, that, uh, that I recognised from the community that I worked with. It's just, and, and part of the story, I think, is that, is that all communities are more and more the same now in the 21st century as more and more more uh, countries become part of this market global experiment. And it is a story of deracination as well, isn't it? Because you say there's one line where he says, we are all refugees from our childhoods. He loses touch with everything that his parents and, and grandparents understood and eventually loses touch even with the norms that he's helped to create. By the time he's an old man, he's not even in touch with the city that he helped to create. Well, as the pace of change intensifies, the speed of change intensifies... I think what starts to happen is a, a collective uh, sense of unmooring is becoming characteristic of people all over the place, whether you live in London or Lahore you know, or Buenos Aires. And, and so in that sense, it's not that we are losing the particularities of our places, but that our places are becoming, the experiences of living in them is becoming more similar because we, aren't, we can't cope very well with this pace of change. We struggle in the face of this change. Peter Moffat, do you, we'll talk about the village later in the programme, but this story of disruption, dislocation, it's not unique to South Asia today. Is it something that Europe and, and our own country has gone through relatively recently as well? Well, the village begins in the summer of 1914 and huge dislocation is about to arrive in the form of the First World War. So, uh, yeah, rupture and dislocation are things that I'm concerned with too. Catherine? Yes? Uh, sorry. Um, uh, Mohsin, uh, let's talk about the, um, uh, the the dangers that start to emerge in the book. The juxtaposition of extreme wealth and extreme poverty, which is not unique to South Asia, but extremely marked in South Asia, that becomes in itself a new kind of danger. And that's something that creeps up on you in the book. It takes you, almost takes you by surprise. Well, I think the extreme stratification of society is something you see globally. You see it in Latin America, you see it in Africa, and you see it in the United States. And, um, you know, where you have sort of the upper... Uh, 1% having, you know, 20%, 40% of all the wealth in the country. So the difference is, uh, is that in a society where poverty has much more of an edge, where not having enough money means not having clean drinking water means dying, um, the, the effect of that juxtaposition is, is more intense. Um, it's easy to gloss over it when, when the poor are less uh, on, on knife's edge. But I think that extreme stratification is, is now a global thing. The, the places where it doesn't exist are the exceptions. And it's very clear in your book, Catherine, because you have this slum community of several thousand people separated by a sewage lake from, on the other side of the lake, the, the, the shining uh, symbolism of uh, a Asia's economic miracle with the fancy hotels around right, the airport. A, Anawadi is, is, is surrounded by five luxury hotels in an international airport, which is getting more glamorous by the day. Um, and what's what's interesting to me, I think, at this particular moment in India, after after eight percent growth over a decade, is that many many people in the community um, feel that they actually can break the barrier between the slum world and the rich one. Um, so so what what was so striking to me is that people who were many of the people in the slum made their living on um, recyclables on the things that the rich people in the communities around them threw away. Uh, and what was so striking is that they were, they were working in garbage. They would see the the used wine bottle. They could see how much that cost. And instead of, you know, instead of saying this wine bottle cost as much as I make in six months, there was this sort of expectation that well maybe I won't be in ten years sitting around having a glass of this myself, but I will. You know, I as 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 a, a young. Uh, scavenger said to me, you know, I don't think I'll be a big something, but a middle something that I can do. And interestingly, the the barriers that really emerge in your book are not between the rich world and the poor world, but within the poor world. Well, I mean, part of part of what we have, we have such sentimental uh, uh, or sensational views of poor communities. It's mutually supportive poor community or a community where everybody is is a drug dealer or a prostitute. Um, so we have these two schools of writing about it, but one of the things that these depictions miss is 
is how much people, how, how intense the, the envy and competition is between people who have just a little bit more and the people who have less. There is a danger with sentimentalising the past because it's more easy to understand, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. My great-grandfather was a um, shepherd and he used to feed his dogs on a bowl of porridge every morning, mm. which I found a kind of, you know, affecting story and I'm quite moved by it until you start thinking about it and examining it and I've got a dog and, you know, a bowl <laughs> of porridge to exist on is hopeless, uh, colossally undernourished. I'm sure his dogs are out on the hill every day working for 12 hours. Impossible for a dog. The other interesting thing, Catherine, is, is you can see the hand, Adam Smith's invisible hand in the community that you document mm. because through the division of labour, because the, the first character we meet in your book, Abdul, he doesn't scavenge for garbage himself. He buys scavenge, so he's one step above the scavengers for gar gar garbage. And he, his particular skill is sorting it into product, produce that he can sell by the kilo. And, and what was, what was uh, astonishing to me, I hadn't known this in advance of, of uh, beginning my reporting, was how closely linked this trade was to the global market. So when I first came to Anawati, the people in the slum were more affluent than they'd ever been before on account of the Beijing Olympics, because that had sent the price of metal and plastic sky high. And what was then just absolutely shattering was that banks failed in Manhattan, and within a matter of weeks, people who had suddenly um, suddenly been able to, as the shorthand in Anawati was, the poor people are the ones who eat the rats in the slum. So, I mean, they had moved past that, and all of a sudden, because of the recession, they were back into, um, into truly abject poverty again. Um, there's, there's not much social solidarity in that community, is there? There's not, not much banding together by the poor. Well, I, you know, what I would say about that is that that's not just a, a matter, that's not just a situation that you find in a place like Anawati. It's a place that I find in communities in the United States, here in London, all, wherever I go in the world right now, and I think that's because um, there has been, in general, a decline in permanent work. And so you've got capital flying all over the planet, um, more and more people improvising, working temp, uh, that changes the nature of the way people relate to each other. It's not just a, an economic problem. It becomes a problem of communities. Well, seen. well one thing which struck me um, was that that in this in this world of, of people who are very entrepreneurial, um, operating individually in the market, they're not atomized. You know, the, the main characters that you follow have have very strong links to other people, mm. their family members oftentimes. Mm. And there's these two counter-narratives between a, a splitting up and atomizing of people into individual market units and this stubborn persistence of a kind of really, um, you know, uh, incredible self-sacrificing oftentimes, loyalty to their parents or their children. Their friends, yeah. I mean, and I think that's that's that seems like a paradox, but it's not really because when the world outside is getting harder and more mysterious and more volatile, you tend to... To, I mean, as you say, this is a world where everybody feels unmoored and that um, the intensity of the relationships that you have with the people you trust can become that more intense. Bruce Norris, you, you have Adam Smith as a character in your play. Uh, we'll talk about in a, that in a minute. But you can see that the, the invisible hand of Adam Smith is still shaping our world. It still works as a wealth-creating mechanism. Well, sure. I mean, it, it, capitalism works for the people who uh, who are lucky enough to find themselves in a position to uh, to utilize certain resources. If you have nothing, if you, the, it presumes that the playing field uh, is level and that all of us have the same uh, opportunities. I mean, we just had a, a, a national election back in the U.S. Uh, in which, like what Mohsin was saying, is the um, you know that uh, capitalism does not have inherent in it a, a narrative uh, for that that uh, can deal with loss. It's all about growth. And so the two narratives that were competing uh, for that national election were one about growth and about uh, individual responsibility, and the, uh, which was the Mitt Romney narrative. And, and Obama's narrative was about how we handle uh, those parts of society, which is really the majority of society, that, that cannot benefit from uh, the free market. And uh, thankfully, from my point of view, the, one of the narratives won this time. One of the corollaries to the rise of Asia, I suppose, is the, the end of what we used to call the American dream. Generation after generation of Americans, going back a couple of centuries at least, came to believe that their children would always be better off than they were. Americans no longer believe that, and well, you find that dream alive very strongly in large parts of Asia, especially China. Well, the more 
important part of the word American dream of the words American dream are, is the word dream. I mean, it is a dream. It's a fantasy about a co continual uh, movement towards ever uh, greater uh, levels of enrichment and power. And uh, and yet that built into that system, uh, it, the system depends on a certain number of people being disadvantaged. Advantage for any one group requires disadvantage. And I think that's the the part that uh, the right in our country sort of tends to overlook. Uh, Catherine, is that a dream, that the idea that your children will be better off than you, has that planted itself in the communities in India that you know? Absolutely, and, and, uh, for, and for reason, because you have, in, in a place like India, you, ha you have um, poverty falling. Um, you have extreme poverty falling, and across the world we've seen extreme poverty fall, I think, um, from uh, in in the last uh, ten years, in a really significant way. So, it's not hope is a political instrument, but it's not a fiction in many of these communities. If if even in in some extremely poor villages that I um, spent time in as a course of my work, uh, people have a sense that it's possible to do in a single generation what it wasn't possible to do in. In a millennia, in a in a place uh, where caste often determined who people became, so there's a there's a real sense of, of possibility. Well, seeing the arc of the of the life that you document in your novel, it strikes me as a very American arc, a very American life story from the 19th or early 20th century. He's he's Carnegie, he's he's any number of American entrepreneurs, he's Rockefeller, that you can self-made man accumulate accumulating vast wealth. Well, the state is getting weaker. Um, all over the world. It, 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 it's trying to reassert itself, but the state can do less to control us, it seems. And uh, at the same time, uh, people, because they're moving, are escaping from oftentimes the hierarchies that exist in their countryside or wherever they were before. So they're a little bit more free to do stuff. But um, against that, I think what starts to happen is, um, uh, at least in Pakistan and I think all over the world, is that as, this, as the growth which is happening manifests itself... But the ability to talk about loss becomes less. What starts to open up is a, is a profound, I would say, almost mental health problem. It's like a, a global depression, not in terms of the GDP going down, but people are depressed worldwide. And so you see that manifest in so many different ways. When, when a young kid goes into their school in America and shoots their fellow students, um, or a young Pakistani teenager puts on a vest and walks into a crowd and blows himself up, those are suicidal actions. Um, married to some great narrative, but the real impulse is to die. And so, and so I think, you know, something is opening up. That I, I agree that there is growth going on and for much of the population, and it does feel, in a sense, like the globalization of the American dream. But on the other hand, what is also happening, what we've seen in America as, you know, the American nightmare, is these people, you know, maybe most human beings today, who are profoundly unsettled by the state of affairs and, and by their inability to, to deal with mortality and to deal with, with the loss that is confronting everyone. Uh, Catherine, t the, one of the remarkable characters in your book is uh, the character of Asha. Mm. She comes across very strongly. Your book actually reads like a novel. When you start reading it, you think you're reading a novel, but it's in fact a piece of literary journalism. Tell me how you came across Asha and tell me what she represents in the book. Uh, well, I, I first met Asha when I was... Uh, it was in November 2007, and uh, I was spending time with a government official, and he said to me, you know microfinance, self-help, that's going to end poverty. So come with me to visit these slums, and you'll see how it's transformed the lives of these women. So he took me to six different slums, and in the last one, by the last one, I figured out that this was, what I was seeing was a total charade, that women were being gathered randomly and told to say how much their lives had improved because they wanted to please the government official. But in that last one, I met uh, Asha, who, who wore... Her, uh, uh, her really difficult childhood in, uh, rural, in a rural area on her face. You could see it. Um, and she had a daughter, Manju. And Manju was poised to be the first female college graduate in the slum. And they were living in this hut by a sewage lake that supported dengue and malaria in, you know, in their hand-built jack. And I thought, okay, so how does a woman like Asha... Manage her husband was an alcoholic, I should say. So how does she manage to produce this daughter, Manju? And the answer was politics and corruption. She was canny enough to recognize that so much of of 
what was spent on anti-poverty efforts in the country was going into the pockets of of the politicians. It was essentially circulating among the political elite. And she said, well, why can't I get a piece of it for myself and my family? And she takes advantage of her equally poor neighbours to do it. Absolutely, she does. Well, I would ask, what is the incentive that the privileged have to reduce inequality? I I actually don't know. And when you go to countries where the legal systems are more broken down, uh, those who are in power are free to uh, run amok a a bit more. I don't don't really understand. I mean, we we can sit here and talk about uh, the people who live in uh, underprivileged neighborhoods all around the globe, but we're people who have nice clothes and cars, and I, I don't understand how... We are supposed to w- willingly give up our advantages uh, uh, voluntarily to make the world more fair. I don't see that as something that, that humans are naturally inclined to do. Bruce Norris, your play, The Low Road, is uh, the, the, the main character in that, Jim Trumpet, is a very eloquent supporter of the idea that aggressive self-interest can promote the, the general good. It's a very persuasive idea, and it, and it has a kind of utopian beauty to it. But like, uh, just like uh, Stalinism, all utopias are equally false. I mean, they don't work out in the end. The, the real world is messy and complicated, and, and it won't ever conform to some sort of perfect ideal. So this, uh, most of the play is set in the 18th century. Adam Smith is That's true. the narrator. That's true. saying that may dissuade people from coming to see it. It is not a play about the 18th century, though, <laughs> no, is it? it is What's not. it about? <clears throat> well, I I suppose it's about a, 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 a philosophical resurgence of the idea of self-interest as the way for uh, an economy and, a, and a, a population to move forward and what the, uh, the risks and downsides of that are. And it's also a fairly lacerating self-satire, isn't it? Because you're, you're having a go at the very people who have bought tickets to come and see your play. <laughs> well, I mean, there's not much point in uh, writing a play about... Uh, 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 impoverished people to be put on in Sloan Square. I mean, because they're not going to be in the audience. The people who are going to be in the audience are people who can afford a ticket. And there's one scene in the play where uh, the very wealthy and rather philanthropical family uh, are examining themselves, and they want to ad- identify very strongly with the poor. Of course. In fact, there's a character who is a, uh, an African-American slave in the play, and they're, they're smitten with the idea of giving him a public forum in which to speak. Now, of course, they're, the reason they're interested in that is because, in, from an ambitious sense, it increases their status as, as virtuous people. And, and virtue is one of the ways that we compete with uh, other, other privileged people to seem better than them. And the uh, the nature of slavery emerges very strongly, and you seem to be drawing a parallel with the world today because your pro free market capitalism character well, Jim Trumpet at- is, is quite happy to ignore the right of his uh, the, a man that he actually owns as a chattel. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, we have thing. we have de facto slavery this very day. I mean, Catherine and I were talking earlier about uh, families in in India, uh, rural India, that are uh, given piecework uh, for for uh, fashion companies to um, to uh, do this kind of the work now that Americans would not do uh, because they feel that they are they are all going to become uh, Andrew Carnegie. So that kind of work is shipped out for, to have so that we have slavery uh, in, uh, beyond our borders. And the global economy from which we all benefit as rich Westerners depends upon that pool of, in effect, slave labor, just in, in the same way that your wealthy family in 18th century Massachusetts depended for their wealth on institutionalized slavery in America. Is Absolutely. That- There's no way that America could have become the powerful nation it is without its legacy of slavery. That is how that economy was built. But most there is a way out of slavery, isn't there? There is a way out of slavery. And as far as, well, as, far as this point of, of, of the slavery being external, I think one of the big crises that many relatively wealthy democratic societies uh, uh, are facing uh, is that um, right now the slavery is coming home. In this globalized market, we are producing uh, people, you know, poor people in, in rich, relatively rich societies who are a lot like poor people in other places and rich people, of course, in poor societies. And that is, that is a shock because it's breaking through the wall. But yes, as far as the, as far as the escape, I think, you know, it, it, throughout, throughout human history, there has been in, in every tradition, whether it's Sufi Islam or Zen Buddhism or Hinduism or uh, mystical you know, Judaism and Christianity, um, and secular forms, uh, the notion that the self-centeredness, which is, which is essential to the market, and increasing self-centeredness makes the market work better, makes us more anxious because the self will cease. And so there's a whole series of, of, of beliefs about how you make the self less central to yourself, one of which, of course, is love. 
which is what I'm interested in exploring because it's a non-religious concept. But the but the basic idea boils down to, you know, in Lahore, I live with my, my parents and my children, which is how I grew up as well. And my parents are getting older. They feel, you know, you can see their generation getting older. The future should be frightening to them. But they are optimistic about the future because they're excited about their grandchildren learning to walk and ride a bicycle. Something has happened to make themselves less central, which is sort of a love for their grandchildren. It's a basic human thing. And this is something which, in a way, the market is trying to, I think, fight. But, but throughout human history, we've had ways of developing this. And it's it, not just the market. I'm terrified of self-help. I mean, you know, go into any bookshop now in central London and there's, there are acres of books on self-help. And self-evidently, it's narcissistic. It's inward-looking. That's the point. And uh, Mosin's book ends, you know, there's a line in it where the character is described as having been beyond himself, which I think is what, you know, we're all forgetting about. Um, because I think self-help, too, in the West, at least, it masquerades as something else. You know, it masquerades as outward-looking, and it isn't really obviously. It isn't really obviously. It goes inward, and it is, is anti-community, actually. And the, and the counterbalancing <coughs> narrative in, in American history, the counterbalancing uh, the free, free market economics, is uh, an esoteric re- relationship to the teachings of Christ and to uh, a sense of community that uh, that are there in the New Testament. And weirdly, there's this kind of schizophrenic siblings, uh, the free market and, and Christianity, which don't coexist very peacefully. Well, there's one interesting line in your... There are many interesting lines in your play, of course, but there's one that's, that leapt off the page at me, and you give it to a very, very minor character at the beginning of Act Two, uh, somebody called Ed, mm-hmm. who doesn't appear mm-hmm. very much in the play at all, and he has this... He's uh, made a lot of money out of the financial mm-hmm. sector, and he's now retired, uh-huh. and banker. he's taking part in... He's a banker, and he's taking part in a, some kind of panel discussion at right. a public meeting, and he says very quietly and very uh, apologetically, some people have begun to question whether capitalism in its current form remains morally persuasive. I don't know if some people have, but one person has, and that's me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's me speaking in the play. But, you know, it, it's important to remember that I used to live in Russia mm-hmm. uh, just after the collapse of communism, and mm-hmm. in the 20th century, a large swathe of humankind tr- chose a collectivist model on which to build an economy, mm-hmm. and it was a disaster. Total it disaster. sank a, a large chunk of the human race into irredeemable poverty from which they're still struggling to recover. Right. Well, I mean, as uh, the economist John Gray would say, I mean, it was a utopian idea, and once again, all utopias will, are, are destined to fail because they don't adequately describe human nature. But there, there is this tension in your play between a collectivist uh, ideal and the, individ- the pursuit of individual wealth. You're right. I mean, I think uh, uh, both uh, th- that either one of those two models could actually uh, predominate is a fantasy. It's always going to be a struggle, an eternal struggle between those two poles, I think. This is not a, your play is not a socialist manifesto, then? <laughs> no. No, I don't know. It's not a manifesto for anything. It's just, a, I, say, I suppose, a warning klaxon to say, let's all be vigilant and uh, watch out for the, for the perils of the, this, uh, this road we're heading down. I mean, in a way, you're doing something relatively easy. You're saying it's my responsibility simply to hold up a mirror to society. I don't have any duty hey, to come up hey, with any I'm solutions. Not, I'm not here to solve anything. I'm just here <laughs> to put on a show. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine. Uh, well, I would say um, that in... in and Awadi, one of the things that I, I was really curious about, the slum was founded in 1991, which at the same time as, as economic liberalization in India. I was really curious what people felt about the time before. And I never met a single person there who wanted, who longed for the, the old days. And as, you know, as, as people would say to me, we're more competitive now, but, you know, so what? What's the, you know, the alternative is, was this abject companionable misery? Um, so, so, so. Uh, but I would also say that that one of the differences between um, Bruce's work and my own, I think that journalism, investigative journalism, particularly, is ends up being an essentially hopeful act because you don't you you don't take the the trouble to document uh, and investigate and name real names or whatever if you don't sort of secretly hope that maybe somebody will Well, m- most read it drama and... tends to be a hopeful act, too. I mean, there's <laughs> always a happy ending in a lot of places. Uh, I, I, I find that um, for the people who have, uh, have a lot, who are privileged, that um, that's a kind of uh, a, a knockout drug, a kind of sleeping pill that actually makes us less vigilant and less aware of, uh, of our responsibilities. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think there is, um, for, for instance, in journalism, there is a, there's a great kind of writing that goes and finds the NGO that's helping all the poor and 
you know, doing all these Yeah, there are narrative things. templates into which sim- simple journalism fits. Right, and so, so if you, you know, as the average public, when they encounter a poor community, they're often encountering it through the prism of... Mm. The, the bountiful charity. And one of the interesting things in my investigation was, was how much outright fraudulence there was, um, mm-hmm. an overstatement in, in the charities themselves. Peter Moffat, uh, Mossin's book charts a man through seven decades of his life. Your uh, new TV series, new, new drama, charts a village through a century. And you start um, in 1914 in rural Derbyshire. Why did you choose that particular community? Um, the landscape is stunning. The camera never leaves the village, mm. so the whole story is told through the life of the village and the people in it. Um, and uh, that's important to me. And I, and I wanted, though, to make that landscape beautiful. Uh, I wanted to make it uh, honest and rugged and true, which I think that place is. I also wanted to put it next to uh, metropolitan life. So in the Peak District, you can walk for miles and miles uh, in extraordinary, blasted, wild landscape come over a hill and there's Manchester right next to you. So the, the presence of urban life next to rural life mm. is something that uh, interested me. And there are echoes of that in what we've been talking about in South Asia today. But one of the things you don't do is you don't make it Downton Abbey. It is beautiful, but it's not romanticised and exoticised in the way that a lot of television drama is. Well, I think you know, Downton Abbey is a slice of life and it's the you know um, uh, upper classes and this is an attempt to look at everybody. And I think um, we tend to look at certain periods in history through the prism of particular uh, groups. And I think 1914 is a classic example where most of television drama seems to settle on the upper class and how they're behaving and what is about to happen. So, you know, there's a sense of the, um, of the past and remembrance about to come, which is, a, a, I think, sort of, you know, predicated partly on the idea of the summer of 1914 as hot and long... And uh, it, uh, and what are we about to get? Mud and blood and the Western Front. But one of the and, most and revealing lines, in, it just happens right at the start, you're interviewing your main character who's 110 years old now, remembering his boyhood in the summer yeah. of 1914. And what the summer of 1914 means to him is not the start of the First World War, but the day the first bus came to the village and all the villagers come out to see it. Well, the entire village turns out because it's a huge event. They've never, you know, the bus arrives for the very first time in the village and brings with it a character from the outside who has strong opinions and big ideas and will change the character of the village as a, as a result. Um, but, uh, you know, March 1914 was incredibly wet and incredibly cold. Uh, but that's not a story that we choose to listen to because we want to hear about the long, hot summer that came before the disaster. Um, and I've just tried to be um, very tough on myself. I have a, another look at history, um, make sure that those myths that get so settled and so set in stone um, are explored properly because underneath, very often, there's something very different. L- life in 1914, if you lived in the Peak District and were a farmer, was phenomenally hard. People dropped dead in the fields from work. You know, Not everybody was Rupert Brooke. But the revealing thing about the bus comment is that it puts you back in the perspective of what the world looked like from the point of view of people who grew up in that village. The important event of that summer was the bus arriving for the first time uh, and not the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand hmm. in Sarajevo. And always, and incredibly important to remember, that you know, when you're writing about the past, you must treat it as if it's the present. Um, because if you don't, then you're in big trouble and it's hmm. something else altogether. You don't have hindsight... You know, when you're alive and well or not well in 1914, that's the point. Yep. And, and a lot of television drama tends to sort of carry, tends to be imbued, I think, with, 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 a, with a sort of knowledge that the people who are in it at the time couldn't possibly have had. Your main character also makes the point that his own father mm. had gone abroad only twice in his life, and by abroad, he said, I mean outside the parish. Now, that would just a hundred years ago, that's not that very long. That would have been a very common experience in Britain. The First World War is probably the event that ruptures that completely and brings, for good or ill, the modernising uh, thrust of, of, of the turmoil of the 20th century. Well, you know, all men fight together, you know, from all classes, and, and that's a, that, that then was a unique event, I think, in the bringing together of different types of people. Um, but uh, there are some small and interesting things about, you know, going off to fight. For example, most men who came from poor backgrounds came back on their first leave uh, about a stone heavier because the food was so much better and they got so much more to eat than they had at home. So there are kind of lots of um, interesting bits of texture that I hope to try and get at 
with the great luxury of writing a drama that covers the entire century in 42 hours. <laughs> um, and, 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 and does the very British experience that you're documenting mm. um, find echoes in the experience that we've been talking about in Asia in our own time? Well, very interesting hearing Catherine talk about n no nostalgia for the past, no looking back, um, because I think, you know, a a as a nation, it's possible to characterise us as a group of people who are fairly obsessed with looking backwards, actually. Uh, and that, that view is, is often a sentimental one, quite often rural, actually. So the idea of a, you know, a village and a landscape around it which is untroubled by uh, progress and todayness is a, is, is a kind fantasy. of ideal and a fantasy that we all like to look and think about. And uh, my interest is just to try and tell the remarkable, brilliant, diverse stories that exist that we, we, we seem to want to ignore because we prefer the sentimental picture of the past. A, a predilection for nostalgia, for golden age thinking, mm, yeah. a desire to live in the past, is a mark of a pretty pessimistic, pessimistic society, isn't it? Well, I mean, look at uh, what we call the Tea Party in the US. I mean, that's a group of people who walk around wearing tricorn hats uh, imagining that there was some golden period in American history where everything was perfect. Uh, I have a father who lives in Texas, and he said to me recently, you know, when I was a child, everything was perfect in the economy. Everyone had, was happy. I said, but you're talking about 1920 in rural South Dakota. That was not representative of the general experience of most people. So everyone's nostalgia is very personal to their own experience. And in the community that you document, Catherine, it's all about the future, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, people have a sense that they can... Um, reinvent themselves to find a niche in the market economy. And, of course, what's, what's incredibly painful is that people can, you know, every day, they, only, only six people in 3,000 in Anawati has permanent work. So think of that. So everybody else is, is essentially going it alone, trying to find that, that place where what, what they can do and what the market needs intersects. And the the, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to document life in the slum over those years was because I thought the imagination and the effort that it takes to get out of poverty um, is, is formidable. It's uh, entrepreneurial, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And it requires a capacity to adjust and readjust to, to a market that's changing constantly. So just, you know, the volatility, um, the the. the the flux in, in the lives of people is just astounding right now. And, and, but it's not just Anawati. It's, I would come home to the United States and people would say to me, gosh, you must have such culture shock. And I'd be like, the... you've lost your job. <laughs> you know, yeah. and people here are working temp. Your man remains optimistic throughout. He continues to think about the future, even as a world that he's frightened of closes in on him. Well, I think, um, yes, that's, that's, that's right. There is, a, there is an inherent optimism in the notion of, of building a, a better life. Um, and then even as that better life begins to collapse and maybe finding some way out of the collapse, uh, emotionally speaking. And, and to me, that's what is, is, is really interesting, is that as we take human empathy and harness it to the market, in other words, I can understand you know, um, what Catherine or, or Bruce might be feeling, but I, I'm using that skill to, to marketize them. Um, there's a separate size of that empathy, which is actually imagining what it's like to be that person, um, to be a person you love, to be somebody else, which is, which is potentially being created that you know, could serve a different function. Well, thank you indeed to all my guests. Mohsin Hamid's How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia is published this month and is the book at bedtime on Radio 4 all this week. Catherine Boo's Behind the Beautiful Forevers is out in paperback. You can see Bruce Norris's play The Low Road at the Royal Court in London until May. And Peter Moffat's series The Village begins on Easter Sunday at 9 o'clock on BBC One. Next week, the myth of civilization with a bit of modern persecution thrown in. Tom Sutcliffe is here with John Gray, Mary Beard, James Lasden and Mark Ravenhill. But for now, from me, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free. Best engaged with those questions and more with group identity and is, is serving less well to do that. Catherine Boo, do you, we'll talk about your book in a second, but do you recognise the trajectory of this life? Very much so. I, in, in a way, I, there were so many... Um, uh, Things that 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 in in your book I, I that uh, that I recognized from the community that I worked with. It's just and, and part of the story I think is that is that all communities are more and more the same now, 
in the 21st century as more and more more of uh, countries become part of this market global experiment. And it is a story of deracination as well, isn't it? Because you say there's one line where he says, we are all refugees from our childhoods. He loses touch with everything that his parents and, and grandparents understood and eventually loses touch even with the norms that he's helped to create. By the time he's an old man, he's not even in touch with the city that he helped to create. Well, as the pace of change intensifies, the speed of change intensifies, I think what starts to happen is a a collective uh, sense of unmooring is becoming characteristic of people all over the place, whether you live in London or Lahore you know, or Buenos Aires. And and so in that sense, it's not that we are losing the particular... ...brought us criminal justice and Silk has written a new series called The Village, which follows a single community in rural Derbyshire through the upheavals of the 20th century. Mohsin Hamid, let's start with you. How to get filthy rich in rising Asia? It doesn't sound like a novel at all. It sounds like a self-help manual. It is a self-help manual, partly as a joke. Um, but partly, once I began joking with the idea of a self-help manual, I started to realise that writing novels for me is an act of self-help. And and even reading novels is a sort of self-help act. So the joke became more earnest as the, prog- as the project continued. You do something quite interesting. You write the novel almost entirely in the second person singular. You, you, you go to her room, you start a new company, you, you, you move to the city, you get an education. Why have you done that? Well, I think one of the things that makes the novel form... Uh, written stories special compared to you know other uh, narrative forms or different from other narrative forms is the degree of of creation that takes place inside the reader so in a novel you get handed the source code of of words letters abstract symbols and you make those into an experience in your mind and thank you for listening to this download of start the week presented by alan little Hello. The unseen guest at the table today is the 18th century Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, the father of liberal economics, whose invisible hand of market forces continues to shape the world we live in, more so now than ever, arguably. With the dramatic economic rise of Asia, 500 years of unchallenged global domination by the West are coming to an end in our lifetimes. What is the infrastructure of opportunity in the crashing turmoil of South Asia's rapid urbanisation? Mohsin Hamid's new novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, takes us into the heart of these questions through the story of one man who rises from rural poverty to extraordinary wealth. The Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Catherine Boo spent years in one slum community in Mumbai and brings to dramatic life characters struggling to survive on the margins of the new economy. Bruce Norris also won a Pulitzer Prize for his play Clybourne Park, which opened here in 2010. He's back at the Royal Court in London with a new play which probes the moral character of an economic model based on the pursuit of individual wealth. And closer to home, Peter Moffat, the television dramatist who... ...nameless. And, you know, it's a, it's, it was a way to... It is a way to change our relationship to the universe by, by viewing it as an extension of the self. Let's talk about the the life that you plot in the book. He starts off in rural poverty and very quickly as a young man gets himself an education and starts to live in a society unrecognisable to his parents, never mind his grandparents, and to start making a contribution to shaping that society. But as he gets older, by increments in the book, his life becomes less and less about opportunity and more and more about danger, even though he's getting fabulously wealthy. Well, the novel is is partly a story of, of growth, which is what the market, what capitalism... Um, the capitalist narrative is a growth narrative. More money, more GDP, more cars, um, a bigger pension fund. But human existence is equally about loss. Um, We lose our health, uh, we lose our loved ones, and we lose our lives. And and, uh, the market doesn't really have a narrative for loss. And that's why this this story, supposedly about growth, begins to elicit this this counter-story about loss, which, which religion, for example, has been one of the ways we've had narratives that help us deal with mortality and loss. But as religion becomes increasingly politicized, um, it perhaps is that, that creation, um, what you, the reader, bring to a book is, I think, quite peculiar. And so this novel is about, is about you, the reader, very substantially. It is, because the main character doesn't have a name, so it's easy, and uh, so he's every man really. He's me. He's anybody who's moved from a village to a city, or anybody who's experienced turmoil in his life. It's a very effective way of uh, enabling the reader to identify more strongly. 
you chose not to give any of your characters in this book names. Yeah, I thought that um, I wanted to blur the boundaries of, of, of the self and um, to play around with that notion. And so when we read fiction and when we are told stories, part of what happens, I think, is that this, this process of empathy is, is engaged. And we start imagining being other people. We start imagining being other selves. Um, having this nameless environment is a way to, to make that easier for the reader to do. It's also something that's been done for over a thousand years in Sufi poetry. So there's a particular stand of, of what you might call Islamic mystical poetry, which is effectively love poems um, that are told to the beloved you, um, that are frequently